On this channel, I often talk about infantry battalions and the officers that commanded them. But how was a battalion actually structured, and how did this hierarchy work? In this video, we'll look at the roles of officers in a battalion and how they work together to command a fighting unit. A battalion was made up of around a thousand soldiers, divided into four rifle companies and a headquarter company. The rifle companies in turn were divided into four platoons of around 30 to 50 soldiers. These platoons were commanded by subalterns, the second lieutenants and lieutenants. Subaltern literally means subordinate, in this case subordinate to the rank of captain. Subalterns can generally be viewed as one group, with no real differences in responsibility between the two ranks. The rank of second lieutenant was effectively a probationary position, lasting up to three years, on completion of which, and after passing the relevant exams, the officer would be judged to be a competent battalion officer and promoted to lieutenant, while still doing the same job as a platoon commander. Part of this focus on competency required junior officers to attend courses in specialist aspects of soldiering, such as musketry, signalling or scouting. They would then return to the battalion and become instructors themselves, the idea being that there would always be at least one subaltern who was an expert in any given topic. Although the subalterns were all effectively equal, there was still a hierarchy within individual battalions. This was an order of precedence based on the date an officer received his commission. The lieutenant who had been in the army the longest was known as the senior subaltern and was responsible for the discipline of the junior officers. Since promotion in peacetime was very slow, the senior subaltern could often have more than 10 years experience and naturally was first in line for promotion. As previously mentioned, promotion was subject to passing exams, which were both practical and theoretical and covered a range of topics from tactics to regimental duties. However, due to the slow nature of promotion prior to the First World War, it was common for a subaltern to have passed the exams for promotion, but remain a lieutenant due to a lack of vacant positions. If they were promoted, however, the next rank up was captain. At full strength, a rifle company usually had two captains, one as the company commander, and one as his second in command. Like the subalterns, although these two officers held the same rank, one was senior to the other, due to their having been in the army longer. This distinction was perhaps made clearest by the fact that the company commander rode on horseback, while the second in command did not. In light of this distinction, the junior captain of a company was often known as the walking captain. By 1914, the majority of captains had seen action in the South African War as subalterns, which shows just how long it took to reach this rank in peacetime. The position of second in command was occasionally filled by a lieutenant, usually the senior subaltern, prior to promotion as well. In an ideal situation, with a battalion at full strength, one rifle company, usually the senior or A company, would be commanded by a major, Again, following the order of precedence, he would be the junior major of the battalion. The other officers of the battalion were part of the headquarter company. This company dealt with the administration and command of the unit, and thus had several officers doing specialist jobs. Usually the most junior was the quartermaster, who was almost always an officer promoted from the ranks of the battalion, often a former sergeant major, or regimental quartermaster sergeant. Unlike other officers, the quartermaster's rank was honorary, which meant that they could rank anywhere from lieutenant to major, while still doing the same job. Closely related to this role was the transport officer. This was a lieutenant who had previously served with one of the rifle companies, and was responsible for the battalion's horse-drawn carts, wagons and travelling kitchens. He commanded a transport section made up of drivers, farriers and other specialists needed to keep the battalion moving. Naturally, this officer was allowed to ride instead of walking. Next was the machine gun officer. This was a lieutenant who had received specialist training in musketry 
and the use of the battalion's two machine guns. He commanded a section consisting of a sergeant, a corporal, and two detachments of six men. Since he needed to be very mobile, he was also allowed to ride a charger. The headquarter company also included the battalion's medical officer. This was the only officer who was not part of the regiment, being attached from the Royal Army Medical Corps. He was usually a captain or a major, but due to the specialist nature of the position, he did not form part of the battalion's order of precedence. The final three members of the headquarter company were the officers who really ran the battalion. First was the adjutant. This was a lieutenant or captain who dealt with administration and discipline. They could also employ an assistant adjutant, usually a second lieutenant, but this officer would also simultaneously command their own platoon and was really just there to gain experience. The adjutant was effectively the commanding officer's left-hand man and was responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the unit, as well as liaison with higher commanders in wartime. They also compiled the battalion's war diary, which are one of the most useful resources for historians today. The commanding officer's right-hand man was the second in command. This post was filled by a major, who was the senior major of the battalion. He was solely responsible for the battalion in the absence of its commander, and would often be forward with the rifle companies in battle. The final member of the headquarter company was the commanding officer. This was a lieutenant colonel who was the most experienced and longest serving officer. It took on average 25 years to reach this position, by which time most officers were in their mid-40s, and as a result, in 1914, 88% of battalion commanders had seen action, either in South Africa or in smaller conflicts, and usually they had also filled various staff appointments and roles out with the regiment. While they were amongst the older soldiers in the battalion, their role was very much to lead from the front, and in 1914 alone, 25 battalion commanders were killed in action. The battalion's officers all filled different roles, but they worked together to run one cohesive unit. Every day, the subalterns took it in turns to be officer of the day or orderly officer responsible for the welfare of the men and the security of the battalion. Similarly, the company commanders and second-in-commands took it in turns to be captain of the week or duty captain, and so shared the responsibility for the thousand men under their command. Being a regular infantry officer was not an easy job, with continual assessment and slow promotion and a high mortality rate in wartime. But for the majority, it was a rewarding one, and one which they dedicated their lives to.